The following program is a PBS Wisconsin original production. Welcome to Wisconsin Public Media's coverage of Governor Tony Evers' second State of the State Address. We are live tonight at the Wisconsin State Capitol in Madison. In a few moments, Tony Evers, the 46th Governor of Wisconsin, will make his way into the Assembly Chambers. He will speak tonight before a joint session of the Wisconsin Assembly and Senate, the State Supreme Court, his Cabinet, and Tribal Leaders. Good evening, I'm Frederica Freiberg from PBS Wisconsin. And I'm Sean Johnson from Wisconsin Public Radio. Tonight, Democratic Governor Tony Evers lays out his plans for 2020. Wisconsin State Senate President Roger Roth of Appleton will provide the Republican response following the governor's State of the State address. And so we are awaiting the governor's arrival uh, here through the assembly chambers where we sit, and then he will make his way uh, through the assembly chambers uh, to be introduced. If you tune in for state of the state formalities, and I'm sure you do, the state, of state senate's already out there, the state supreme court, they've already been introduced. Um, yeah, you've got uh, people in the gallery there who are you know, guests of somebody in the crowd, perhaps tonight, or of the governor. And so we're waiting for the governor himself, Tony Evers, to deliver his second State of the State address. Uh, it could be on the brief side tonight, um, as, as State of the State addresses go. And, you know, possibly fitting, given that we have maybe two to three more months of the legislative session this year and uh, split party control, a Democratic governor, Republican legislature. And they have trouble agreeing on some of the big stuff, I think it's fair to say. They do indeed. And yet it seems that uh, both uh, today uh, here at the Capitol and, and tonight, potentially in this speech, uh, the theme seems to be one of trying to strike kind of a conciliatory tone uh, in this divided government. But you just seem to sense this kind of partisan animus right under the surface in all of this. You, you were um, listening to Republican Speaker Robin Voss this afternoon. He had an availability, and he was trying to talk about bipartisanship, kind of. Kind of. You've got this war of bipartisanship, sort of, between the governor and Republican leaders, both saying they're the ones who really know how to get it done. Uh, Speaker Voss actually read from the definition of bipartisanship from the dictionary to prove his point. Uh, but he said that the governor needed to tone down his rhetoric that prompted a question about last year's uh, lame, duck special, uh, you know, lame duck session of the legislature, the extraordinary session, said, did, did that tone down the rhetoric? Uh, Speaker Voss said that it did, but, you know, kind of gives you uh, a snapshot of what life is like in Wisconsin state government. They do agree on a lot of bills that right. you may not know about or that don't get talked about too often. You'll, you'll hear both sides brag about that, actually. 95% right. of the bills they agree on. It's those ones that they don't agree on um, that get a lot of attention and there have been a lot of those, actually, well, when it comes to some of the big issues yes, of the day. Yes, they can be the, the big issues. Um, and I, I thought it was of note that Speaker Voss said that, in fact, that lame duck session fostered bipartisanship, which um, seems hard to understand how. Yeah, I think his, his point was that it gave the legislature equal footing with the governor. So, um, I, but as you know, that, that definitely set off some um, bad blood between Republicans and Democrats late last year and in the beginning of this year. But you were going to hear uh, the governor talk about areas where they have agreed in his speech tonight. You heard Republicans talk about it earlier today. Um, and you're going to hear the governor of uh, Tony Evers be introduced to the state assembly here momentarily by Assembly Sergeant at Arms Anton and Byers. The joint convention will come to order. The joint convention will come to order. The chair recognizes the Assembly Sergeant at Arms. Mr. President and members, the governor of the great state of Wisconsin, the Honorable Tony Evers. And so, to loud applause, the governor makes his way 
down the aisle of the assembly chambers. This is the part of the night where it's okay for everybody to stand up and clap. Uh, you'll see as the speech goes on, there'll be some, some parts where uh, one side of the aisle is up, the other side is down, as is, you know, become pretty much the custom for a state of the state speech. We do know some bits and pieces of what the governor is going to talk about from what he talked about earlier. Uh, he released excerpts from his speech today. Yeah. One, of, one of the quotes was, from nonpartisan redistricting, he says, to investing in our rural communities, we've got work to do. So stand by um, for some more on those items redistricting and investing in rural communities. Yeah, you will hear some more details about what that means to the governor tonight in his speech. Um, you're going to hear a little bit of a, a victory lap in terms of what he was able to accomplish in his budget. You see him shaking his hands there with now Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, Senate President Roger, Roger Roth, and here okay. is Governor Tony At this Evers. time, it is my honor to introduce the governor of the great state of Wisconsin, the Honorable Tony Evers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Supreme Court justices, tribal nation leaders, constitutional officers, member of the Wisconsin National Guard, and active and retired members of our armed forces, cabinet members, Senate President Roth, Majority Leader Fitzgerald, Minority Leader Schilling, Speaker Voss, and Minority Leader Hintz, legislators, distinguished guests, and most importantly, the people of Wisconsin, welcome and thank you for being here tonight. My partner in mischief, Kathy, is up in the gallery tonight, along with our daughter, Katie, our son-in-law, Colin, their, their daughter, Hannah, our son, Nick, and our, and our daughter-in-law, Landa. Where are you folks? I can't see you. Thank you so much for your love and support. Uh, I'm with you, and I won't embarrass you tonight. <laughs> I'm Tony Evers, and I'm incredibly proud to be here as the 46th governor of the state of Wisconsin to deliver my second State of the State address. As I reflect on my first year in office, although there were setbacks and occasional political, political posturing, what I call puffing and puffing. We also had a lot of success, and I'm proud of everything we accomplished in just a year's time. One of the best parts of doing my job is getting out of the cap capital and visiting with people all across the state. And holy mackerel, that's what I did. Lieutenant Governor Barnes and I visited all 72 Wisconsin counties this past year. Actually, the bad news is that Lieutenant Governor Barnes and I raced to see who could be the first to visit those 72 counties, and he beat me by about five days. But the good news is we're just a few weeks into 2020, and I've already got a head start on you this year. <laughs> this past year, we also brought science back to the state of Wisconsin. And we acknowledge that climate change exists and it's a threat we need to start taking seriously. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Barnes is the chair of the Climate Change Task Force, working with local governments, governments, uh, industry and business leaders, and people from across the state 
and on environment, stewardship, and sustainability. Thanks to Lieutenant Governor Barnes for your good work on this. I'm also proud to sign a, that I was able to sign executive orders affirming equity, inclusion, respect, and dignity for the state workers in this great state. Last year, I visited every single one of our agencies to thank our employees and to hear about the good work they're doing in our state. We should be proud of the folks who serve Wisconsinites every day, and I look forward to continuing to listen and elevating their voices and their work. I also promised that criminal justice reform would be a central part of my administration. Although we have a lot of work to do on this issue, we made some important progress this year. For the first time in eight years, a governor stepped a foot inside of one of the, our correctional institutions. And actually, it wasn't just one, I visited six. The Parole Commission is working to make sure we get our parole system back on track. Our Parole Commission Chair, John Tate II, is here with us in the gallery tonight, and he has been doing a great job. Thanks for all your work on this issue, John. Part of reforming our criminal justice system is believing in forgiveness and the power of redemption, things that I think speak to the character of our state. This past year, I also made good on my campaign promise to reinstate the Pardon Review Board. We granted the first pardons in our state in nine years, offering forgiveness and a second chance to those folks who have made amends in their own lives and their communities. Congratulations to Katie and Annette, who are two of the folks we pardoned since taking office, and they're also up there in the gallery. And thank you for your being here. State of the State address, I asked the legislature to set politics aside so we could work together on the issues facing our, our state. I said I expected bills to be passed with broad support and in the spirit of bipartisanship. So one of the things I'm most proud of is that more than 95 percent of the bills I signed my first year in office had bipartisan support. Major accomplishment. By golly, people worked together on some really important issues. Representative, Representative Lautenbach, Representative Kolsti, Senator Koyenga, and Senator Buley came together to work on expanding access to health care in rural areas by making sure that Medicaid covers telehealth services in Wisconsin. Thanks to Senator Bernier, Senator Schachner, Schachner, Representative Zimmerman, and Representative Rostov. Voters will not be denied their right to vote because they have a disability. And because of Representative Thiesfeld, Representative Bowen, Senator Johnson, and Senator Darling's good work, we signed a bill to train commercial drivers on recognizing and preventing human trafficking in Wisconsin. These bills exemplify what we can accomplish when we're focused on what unites us rather than what divides us. So I want to thank all of you for this good work. So I believe, as I've often said, there's more to an economy than just counting job creation. 
asking job creators across our state, and they'll tell you that investing in a foundation of good quality of life and a diverse workplace is critical to a growing economy. We have to connect the dots and focus on the fundamentals of economic development. It's pretty simple stuff, folks. Good roads, good schools, and good health care. And this year, we got back to the basics and made a down payment on these important priorities. Economic development starts with education. You know what's best for our kids is what's best for our state. Although the, budget, although the budget I signed did not include my proposed $1.4 million for our kids, we still provided the largest increase in general aid to schools in more than a decade. Working together, we were able to invest more than $500 million in K-12 education, including the first increase in special education in 10 years. Thank you. I also use my veto authority to add nearly $100 million more in per pupil aid than the budget passed by the legislature. When we talk about education, we can't ignore the elephant in the room of student debt. So tonight I'm excited to announce that I will be signing an executive order creating a task force on student debt in Wisconsin. to work on making higher education available to more folks in our state. We have to understand how education-related debt affects not just our students, but their families, too. And we have to address the fact that student debt is preventing folks from buying a car, starting a business, saving for retirement, and starting for a family. So thank you to our Department of Financial Institutions Secretary, Kathy Blumenfeld, who is going to be leading this effort. I'm excited for the task force to get to work. In addition to investing in our kids this year, we got back to the basics of economic development by investing in our transportation system. The budget I proposed provided a sustainable, long-term solution to our transportation funding crisis. And by the way, it didn't include raising the gas tax by a dollar. <laughs> That said, the budget I did sign, however, provided more than $465 million in new funding for our highways, local roads, and transit aids, $320 million of which is going to fix our highways across the state. And we did that all by while keeping bonding at the lowest level in 20 years. Thank you all for that. able to do some important work in making health care more affordable and accessible. We weren't able to expand Medicaid, which would have allowed us to bring in $1.6 billion in new federal investment into our health care system. But the people's budget still made some important investments in lead testing and abatement, stabilizing the individual health care market and lowering health insurance premiums, and expanding access to rural health care. Finally, I delivered on my campaign promise for a 10 percent tax cut for Wisconsin's family. The people's budget, together with Assembly Bill 251, provided more than $500 million in tax relief for working middle-class families. That's money back in your pockets, folks.
I know, I know the budget I signed didn't include everything that every, everybody wanted. I know it didn't include everything I wanted. But because of the budget we propose, we are able to move the needle on critically important issues, some, time, some for the first time in a generation. Now, as 2019 came to a close, we also began a new decade. And while there is time to contemplate 10 years' worth of successes and failures, we must fight the temptation to cling to the nostalgia of yesterday. There is too much work to find comfort in complacency. We must set out in a new decade with a renewed set of purpose. We must be resolved to confront the challenges we face today, and we must be eager to embrace what may come tomorrow. The struggles we face will test both the depth of our empathy and the strength of our selflessness. But Wisconsinites, I know we are up to this task because it is the depth of our empathy and the strength of our selflessness that has defined who we are as a people for generations. People like Julie and John, who after losing a family member to suicide last year, decided to use the corn maze they host at their farm to raise awareness for suicide prevention. Julie and John are here tonight with us. Thank you so much, folks. Please stand. People like Reverend Mowers, who, after the only homeless shelter in his area closed a few years ago, worked with the Department of Safety and Professional Services to expedite the new shelter and get it open so his neighbors could have a place to stay. Reverend Mowers is up in the gallery tonight, and well-deserved thanks. Thank you very much. People like Dua, who, when a gunshot rang out in the halls of her high school, ran to the nearby mosque where her father works and took more than 100 students with her to provide them shelter and cover. Thank you, Dua, for your courage and your bravery. Because of people like Dua, Dave, Julie, and John, and people just like them all across Wisconsin, that I have never been more hopeful about the future we're going to create. When we get to choose how we define the next decade, and folks, we're going to do that tonight. We're starting tonight. In Wisconsin, we're known as America's Dairyland. It's even a It's on, our, it's on our license plates, and for good reason. In 2018, we produced more cheese than any other state, producing more than 26 percent of the nation's cheese, and we account for more than 14 percent of the nation's milk production. And all that dairy production and processing boasts $43.4 billion in economic activity and supports almost 79,000 jobs. And it's not just, yeah, how about that? There's milk in there. <laughs> and it's not just cheese and dairy, folks. Our agriculture diversity is one of the strengths of our state. We're one of the leading growers and processors of vegetables, from potatoes to green peas to snap beans and carrots, and we produce 62 percent of the nation's cranberry crop. In 2018, we exported more than $3 billion in agriculture products to more than 140 countries. All in all, agriculture contributes nearly $105 billion to our state's economy. But at the end of the day, these numbers tell the story. 
of the folks whose sweat, work, and pride have been the pillar of our state for generations. America's dairy land is more than bushels and bales and hundredweights. It's about people. Wisconsin was raised on the land of Native Americans who came before us and built on the backs of those farmers who came after them and survives by the hands of the kids and grandkids who are the keepers of this legacy. Yet despite our history, this tradition has been challenged. Between 2011 and 2018, Wisconsin lost about a third of our dairy farms. We lead the nation in farm bankruptcies. We've endured the consequences of unnecessary and unproductive tariffs and trade wars. And we've heard people who've said there's no place for small farms anymore. They ought to go big or bust. Well, they are wrong. They don't know Wisconsin. state, no one carries the burden alone. We have leaned on farmers and their families. We have depended on their dedication, and we relied on their resilience. We have not forgotten those who have shared the harvest and bounty, feeding our families, our communities, and our state, and our country for more than a century. And tonight, we say that we are ready to be a partner in the promise of posterity. I'm announcing a three-pronged plan to start addressing these challenges. First, tonight, I'm calling a special session of the legislature next week to take up legislation to invest in our farmers, agriculture industries, and our rural communities. Package of bills we'll announce tomorrow includes a bill creating the Wisconsin Initiative for Dairy Exports. We have to start maximizing the efficiency in our small and middle-sized middle farms, and we need to build Wisconsin's dairy brand in international markets and increase dairy imports, exports. So we're going to Gesundheit, too. So, <laughs> So we're going to set a goal of increasing Wisconsin's dairy exports by 20 percent of the United States milk supply by the year 2024. <laughs> Additionally, we're going to expand our farm center and increase staffing at the UW Extension to ensure that farmers and agriculture industries have partners and support closer to home. At the same time, we're also going to work to get the food our firm farmers produce to the tables right here in Wisconsin. So we're not only going to bolster our Farm to School program, but we're also announcing our Farm to Fork program that will help connect our farmers and the food they produce with our universities, our technical colleges, our hospitals, and local businesses across the state. And finally, we're going to create a new program that will focus on getting our farmers access to mental health services in Wisconsin. Our Our Farm Center is doing important work in this area, but we know folks are really struggling and they need access to those resources closer to home. Our mental health program will assist farmers in accessing mental health support. They will also help coordinate local and regional peer support programming and provide confidential one-on-one -on -one counseling and assistance to our farmers.
The second prong of our plan is ensuring that investing in farmers, agriculture, and rural communities is part of our broader economic development strategies. So tonight, I am also announcing that I will be working with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation to establish the Office of Rural Prosperity. The office will provide one st a one-stop shop for the folks to navigate state programs and the resources that are available that are tailored to rural communities, businesses, and workers. Finally, the third prong of our plan is to develop lo long-term strategies on this issue, not based on what folks in Madison think is best, but based on the feedback and input from folks all across the state. So tomorrow, I'll make good on my campaign promise to create a Blue Ribbon Commission to help promote agriculture and rural economic prosperity. Our Blue Ribbon Commission on Rural Prosperity will convene folks in different industries from across the state. They'll work together to develop a long-term strategy on how we can best support the needs of rural Wisconsinites and rural communities. Some of these proposals aren't new. Many of them are a form of what I propose in, in my budget that were unfortunately taken out. But here's the bottom line, folks. We're losing more than two dairy farms a day. And for each day we delay, the challenges will get harder and harder. So I want to be clear. I'm not under any misguided belief that what I'm proposing today is a silver bullet. In the coming months, it's going to take more listening than talking to hear from our farmers and our rural communities about how we can continue to invest in agriculture and rural prosperity across our state. But we have to start someplace, and we'll start tomorrow. Finally, in addition to addressing these challenges, I'd like to talk about another issue folks in our state care about. In 2017, Hans, who is a dairy farmer and a Lincoln County Board Supervisor, introduced a resolution supporting nonpartisan redistricting, kicking off a trend across our state. Today, 50 counties representing 78 percent of the people of Wisconsin have passed similar resolutions. Hans is up there in the gallery with us tonight. Hans, thank you for your work on this very important issue. Unfortunately, nonpartisan redistricting legislation has been introduced for years. It's even received bipartisan support. The bill has never been given a public hearing. Well, when more than 80 percent of our state supports medical marijuana and 80 percent support universal background checks and extreme risk protection orders, and 70 percent support expanding Medicaid, and elected officials can ignore those numbers without consequence, folks. Something's wrong. The people who work in this building, who sit in these seats, and who drive the policies in our state should not be able to ignore the people who sent us here. The will of the people is the law of the land, and by golly, people should not take no for an answer. So tonight, as promised, I am bringing the fight for nonpartisan redistricting 
to the legislature. In the coming days, I will be signing an executive order to create a nonpartisan redistricting commission who will draw the people's maps. Redistricting Commission will consist of the people of our state, not the elected official, not lobbyists, not high paid consultants. The People's Map Commission will visit every congressional di district, hear directly from folks across our state, and draw fair, impartial maps for the legislature to take up next year. I believe, and Wisconsinites do too, that people should get to choose their elected officials, not the other way around. So when the people's maps are present, presented to the legislature next year, I hope they will receive unanimous bipartisan support. Nonpartisan redistricting and investing in our rural communities, to addressing youth vaping and capping the cost of insulin, to choosing to closing the dark store loophole and getting PFAS out of our water, we've got a lot of work to do. There's no rest for the elected folks, and we've got a lot to do to get done before anyone takes a vacation. But as I stand here today and we turn to face the horizon of the upcoming decade, I have never been more hopeful about Wisconsin. And it's up to us to decide what kind of state we'll, we'll be 10 years from now. We can choose to relitigate re past political tussles, or we can choose to transcend animosity to rise and greet the problems before us. We can <laughs> We can choose to resent the hand that helps another, or we can choose to celebrate our neighbor's prosperity because therein lies our prosperity too. We can choose to say in this state, you go it alone, or you don't go at all, or we can say, in Wisconsin, when we move forward, we all go together. And you bet, we will most certainly face challenges, and yes, we will face adversity, but let us choose to be fine not by our indifference, but by our decency. Let's choose to be defined by the depth, depth of our empathy and the strength of our selflessness. And let us plunge into the new decade, chasing the charge of our bearers who came before us. Let's move forward together. It's time to get to work, folks. Thank you, and on Wisconsin.
And so concludes Governor Tony Evers' second State of the State address before a joint session of the Wisconsin Assembly and Senate. Well, the marching band, the UW marching band, finally got both sides of the aisle to applaud together. Yeah, they, <laughs> they were, were not quite on the same page on a lot of the stuff, but they liked the band for yeah, sure. That's right. So the, the headline uh, from the policy parts of Governor Evers' speech tonight uh, could be said to be that he is calling a special session next week around agriculture. Yeah, I mean, if you're a governor that has a Republican-dominated legislature um, and you don't see eye to eye to them on many big things, what's one thing you can do when they're not going to necessarily pass your bills or pass your budget? You can call a special session. And so that's something that Governor Tony Evers has done before. He's going to do it on agriculture. And uh, this is interesting, too, because he's going to be calling this special session the same week that Vice President Mike Pence is in Wisconsin. So... We know that dairy is going to be a heavily political issue in the year 2020 in the dairy state. And uh, Governor Tony Evers is going to be talking about this in a special session. He says that this uh, special session has um, a kind of a raft of bills included in it. One uh, would be about increasing exports of uh, dairy products. Another would be to um, allow better access to mental health care for uh, dairy farmers. And um, another would be to establish something called uh, the Office of Rural Prosperity. Now, the other thing, um, another headline perhaps from this speech uh, might be that uh, Governor Evers says that he will be um, exacting an executive order on redistricting. He says he will create a nonpartisan redistricting commission uh, to create what he calls the people's maps. And the thing to remember about both of these steps, the special session and the executive order, he can call the special session. He can't force the legislature to meet. He can sign an executive order that doesn't carry the force of law. So there are limitations to what the governor can do in these areas, but definitely got his side of the aisle fired up on those. And, and not the other side of the aisle. Not again, so much. Noted, right. Uh, Wisconsin State Senate President Roger Roth will lead Republicans in the upcoming legislative session. Roth represents Wisconsin State Senate District 19 in the Fox Valley. Senate President Roth has tonight's Republican response. Good evening. I'm Senate President Roger Roth, and I represent Appleton and part of the Fox Valley, where my wife Rebecca and I live and raise our five young children. It's an honor for me to speak with you tonight and share the progress Wisconsin has made for our workers, businesses, and families all across our state. Wisconsin is doing great. The state of our state is very strong. In the last decade, Wisconsin Republicans have enacted reforms that continue to ignite our economy and have taken our state from budget deficits to budget surpluses. We've made investments in our state's infrastructure, worker training, and our kids' education. The results have been spectacular economic growth, record low unemployment, higher wages, and frozen college tuition, all without raising taxes. In fact, the average resident's tax burden is at its lowest level in nearly 50 years, while incomes continue to grow. That's a winning combination. It's the Wisconsin way, and it's all made possible by the tough reforms we passed that have proven to benefit Wisconsin families from Ashland to Whitewater and everywhere in between. The Republican budget we passed and signed into law prioritizes transportation infrastructure, education, and increased health care access for all Wisconsinites, all without asking you to pay more in taxes. We also invested more money in the state's rainy day fund, so in the event of an economic downturn, the state doesn't come running asking you to pay more at the worst possible time. Now, recently, Governor Evers was asked to grade his first year in office. He gave himself a grade of incomplete. I appreciate his honesty. Listening to Madison elites while ignoring the rest of Wisconsin isn't a recipe for success. Unfortunately, he has chosen to veto important legislation we crafted hand in hand with the people of Wisconsin. He vetoed a middle class tax cut that would have provided $340 million in relief to hardworking families across our state. He vetoed a mental health crisis center in northwest Wisconsin in favor of sending that money to, you guessed it, Madison. Friends, he even vetoed a bill protecting our most vulnerable youths, babies born alive after a failed abortion. Yet despite all of this, 
we as Republicans are committed to continuing to find ways to work with our counterparts here in the Capitol, like we did with our most recent budget. We stand ready to work together in all things that hold true to the values of Wisconsinites and improve our state. The priorities that we'll be leading on over the next few months do just that. We'll be working on legislation to keep driving down health care costs, streamline inefficiencies in our government, protect our families with tougher penalties for repeat violent criminals, and return back to you your hard-earned money to lower property taxes. And we'll do all of this while defending your constitutional rights to free speech, to keep and bear arms, and due process under the law rights that some here in the Capitol are seeking to roll back. As a kid growing up in Menasha, I helped my father build houses at a very young age. I saw how coming together with your friends and your neighbors builds not only a home, but a community we can all be proud of. Like you, I know what it's like to put in a hard day's work, not giving up until the job's complete. We here in the legislature will never forget that as we continue to work to make sure that government barriers don't stand in the way of you pursuing your dreams. In 1851, when our forebears chose a motto for our great state, they settled on one simple yet powerful word, forward. I think that's because they were an unsatisfied people always moving forward, always working to better their lives, to better their communities, and better their children's future. Come to think of it, they were a lot like you and me. And we here today are heirs to their faith, determination, and sacrifice. And so to you I say, come, let us go forward together. After all, it's the Wisconsin way. And on a personal note, I'd like to wish my beautiful wife, Rebecca, a happy ninth anniversary. And with that, from the Capitol, good night, and may God continue to bless our great state. That was Wisconsin State Senate President Roger Roth. If you would like to watch tonight's speech and the Republican response again, we will have it posted later this evening on our website at pbswisconsin.org. We will have continuing coverage in reaction to Governor Tony Evers' State of the State Address this Friday evening at 7.30 on Here and Now. Wisconsin Public Radio will also continue to follow developments from the Capitol both on the air and online at WPR.org. You can also hear more discussion tomorrow on The Morning Show with Kate Archer Kent from 6 to 9. We want to thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Sean Johnson with Wisconsin Public Radio. And I'm Frederica Freiberg with PBS Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. This concludes our coverage of the 2020 State of the State Address.